Hi everyone, um, I'm Sam Sibley and I'm the Global Head of Citizen Developer at the Project Management Institute. So thanks for joining. Hello everyone, Arjun Jamnadas, uh, Managing Director at FTI Consulting based out of London. Good to be here. Oh, I have my own. Uh, hey everybody, my name is Philip Lakin. I'm the co-founder and CEO of No Code Ops, which is a community and newsletter uh, for no code operational professionals. And we also created a software tool called Switchboard, which is a monitoring tool for Integromat and Zapier. Okay. Uh, for those I haven't met, Eric Ogilvy, Senior Sales Enablement Manager with Creatio. Uh, so great to see everyone again. Look forward to the discussion. Okay. And uh, guys, we'll encourage all the questions coming from you. So we will try as much as we can to make it an interactive session, not just like a small discussion in a small circle. And we do have a sticker distributor right yeah. there. So Every time you ask a question, <laughs> you'll get a sticker and a potential to get into that helicopter. So um, let's probably kick it off with a super simple question. So why do an organization need a center of excellence? Right? So but it's, it's kind, of, kind of obvious. But in the meantime, you know, as you're thinking about like, setting up that center of excellence, how do you sell it internally, and how do you explain what, where, where is the need? So we'll start, start with you, Sam, right? Sure. Yeah, thanks, Andy. So I think the first thing to think about, really, is the operating model needed as you scale this, right? Because when you start and you do some discovery work, you do some experimentation work, a lot of that's quite easy, right? A lot of that's very much siloed, maybe in a department. But as soon as you want to try and scale this, the operating model, the culture, the governance structures change. And the concept of a center of excellence is really to put the, that structure and those parameters around the activity, right? Whether that's around, as I mentioned, the types of blueprints, the types of training, the engagement structure, you know, what should you do, what shouldn't you do? This is what a center of excellence is all about, right? Providing that framework. I think for organizations that I see who are really successful, they have that center of excellence in place that really is that fusion team between the business and IT coming together to really adopt that. So that's my view on, okay. on the COE. That's uh, wonderful. Eric, would you have a different opinion about this? Uh, I do not. I know a lot of you know, individual benefits, obviously. You know, I think when we were talking about uh, you know, the fusion and creating things, I think obviously having that foundation built with your center of excellence, it makes things even deployment even faster because you have people who know what they're doing and they've done it before, right? So you don't have to rebuild the wheel um, when you have that, that set of experts in-house anytime you want to spin up a new solution. Okay. Philip, and what's your opinion? Yeah, so um, like Sam said, it, it, it's quite easy to bring a no-code tool in and start experimenting and seeing what works and what doesn't work. Um, but uh, part of the promise of no-code is that anybody in the organization can be a developer. And so a center of excellence, in my opinion, is how, do you, is how you control that chaos, which um, everybody wants to create. But when it comes to uh, management, maintenance, quality, governance, uh, these are things that technology alone can't solve. And so just like uh, developers have methodologies and frameworks for working together, you know, whether it's Agile, Scrum, whatever it is, um, you know, for no coders uh, to be able to build, deploy, manage, maintain to do mm -hmm. you know, that, that whole development life cycle. Um, if you want more people to be involved in it, you need a framework and guardrails that allows it to sustain so that uh, you don't fall into the pick, you know, the pit trap of um, great, now only one person or two people at the company are allowed to touch the no code infrastructure. And that's where you get back in centrality and you lose the promise of no code. Mm -hmm. So, center of excellence, uh, you know. That good stuff. Helps with that. Good, um, good stuff. And um, Arjun, I want to put you on the spot. Yeah. Like I, I, I want to give you a notice for that. So uh, imagine uh, that uh, you've been brought to a, a room with uh, a CEO, and now you need to give an elevator pitch about why a company needs a center of excellence. You can you can disregard the question and we will move on, or you can, <laughs> yeah, or, or we can try to give this elevator pitch. I'll give that a shot. Okay. Right. Um, so I think. Here we're talking about a no-code center of excellence, right? And, and the first thing that you know, comes to mind is no-code is, is still quite a new thing in the enterprise, right? And certainly being used outside of the IT department. And so I think more than anything, it's the embodiment of this new way of working. And it's in the name. It's a center of excellence, right? People need to see something. They need to feel something tangible, right? Which it's a co-located center of how to do things right. And no-code is still relatively new. Right? And once you have this kind of bastion, I think that gives it a lot more power, a lot more weight. OK. That was a very strong elevator pitch. <laughs> uh, make sure that we, we have, or if we have a recording, we need to extract it. And then you can publish on your website. <laughs> on LinkedIn, okay? uh, and I will have a question for the audience, because we all participate. 
So imagine that we are setting up the center of excellence. Uh, where, do believe, where do you believe the center of excellence should sit? Is it IT? Is it business? Is it digital? Based on your experience. Who has an opinion? Business. Why business? Okay. So business because they know their pro. They should know. Yeah. I, I agree with you on that. They should know. So business because they should know their process. Is there any opposite opinion about that? We'll see. We'll ask the panel as well. So Arjun, <laughs> we'll, we'll proceed with you. So what is your opinion? Like organizationally, where do we need to find the spot for Center of Excellence? Yeah, so it's, it's a question I've uh, thought about frequently. And it almost feels like if you've got a, a virtual center of excellence, right, and if it's doing what it needs to do, it almost doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. When I say what it needs to do, right, it is, it is that place where you have that collaboration between IT and the business manifesting, right? It is where both sides of the organization, as peers, are bringing in what they do best, right? in order to create something that works for the business, right? The IT is the custodian of the platform. They are provisioning it. They are providing rules of engagement. Whereas the business is consuming it, but you know, they have parameters. And that center of excellence, whether it sits in the business or the IT, it doesn't really matter. But as long as the governance is in place to allow collaborative and on, on the same footing, right, input from both the IT and the business. Mm -hmm. So we have two ideas now. One doesn't matter. Uh, and the second one is business. So Sam, I know that you have been working a lot with large, gigantic organizations that are setting up uh, sizable uh, centers of excellence. So what's your kind of best practice and uh, experience? I think it comes down to two questions. The first, the size of the organization. Mm -hmm. Second is the belief and the investment and the backing from mm -hmm. senior leadership. These, these two points are really important, right? Because if you think about it, if you've got a major organization that's trying to set up a global COE across countries, regions, personas, different teams, different technologies, mm -hmm. and they're doing it at scale, mm -hmm. the requirement for IT to be a core component of that and to house and to control that governance is critical. Mm -hmm. I've not seen a single organization, big organization, I'm talking about thousands, 10,000s of citizen developers. But if you've got an organization that's trying to be super agile, time to market's important, you know, the business actually need to be empowered, there's not a huge amount of governance, and you know, light touch governance is what we always talk about, hyper agility, then the business can house it, right? So I agree with Arjun, it's very much about the context, mm -hmm. the investment that you've got, the leadership belief in what mm -hmm. you're trying to do. Um, and I think sometimes you just gotta ask those questions at the beginning and see you know, what's possible, right? Mm -hmm. Don't put a structure in place if it's not the right structure for your business, just because people say that is the blueprint. Right. Yeah. Philip, uh, imagine the situation. You, uh, you're meeting a customer, and then cu this customer tells you, we're really, really excited about no code, and we want to delegate, we want our IT to kind of invest into uh, no code development, and we want IT to, to, to own no code development. What would be, would be your immediate response to that? You know, it scares me a bit when IT owns it, you know, full <laughs> out, because at the end of the day, it's about solutions. So, uh, and what does the business need? So, um, at the end of the day, uh, IT is not going to be the department that drives the outcomes. They're going to help make them sustainable and scalable, and that's so important. But at the end of the day, IT doesn't have KPIs to hit around, uh, you know, how many... Uh, you know, how many hours or minutes can we save on this process? That, that's, not as, that's not what they're getting judged in, um, and, and graded on performance-wise. So the business, in my opinion, is always going to be like the hardcore driver of, mm -hmm. uh, of the need on that front. And they need to work really hand-in-hand -hand with IT to make sure that if we want to scale this thing, uh, we do it properly. But I'm, all, I'm like full tilt business side, very opinionated. Okay. Uh, yes. Yeah. So feel free to disagree. No, so I, I, I agree. I would never disagree with Phil. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> um, so I think there's two sides of this. The first one is you don't want to stifle innovation, right? The whole concept of no code and citizen development and empowerment and democratization is the ability on the front line to impact and make change happen, right? So you don't want to stifle that. So every barrier you put in place through IT, you're actually removing that ability to create change quickly. 
which actually removes the requirement for the reason why we're all here. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, if you're looking at scaling this, the enterprise architecture becomes an important component to this. So you cannot just forget that. I think IT absolutely, from a governance, from a framework point of view, they need to be involved. But in terms of the development, understanding the opportunity, the business. So I think a COE, see it as you t we talk about fusion a lot. Mm -hmm. A COE is a fusion, right? It is a, is a joint venture between different critical parts of the organization, in my view. So I think I'm supporting you. Yeah. But. You know, it's, like, it's a funny metaphor the way I see it is, you know, like, say you have like a really beautiful downtown town center, you know, where everything's built up and beautiful, you know, Chicago, right? Per, you know. And then uh, the artists in the town, right, uh, can't afford to live there anymore. So then they move to a new place uh, on the outskirts and warehouses and stuff, but then it becomes cool. And then, then that gets developed. Like, and it keeps going further and further. That's the way I see it, right? That like the no-coders on the business side are like the artists going, cool, we want to like work, we want to figure out how to do this new thing in this new way. And then eventually it gets professionalized. But yeah, if you start with the professionalization of it, it just stifles things. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I, I have an analogy because I started my career uh, in sales and then I moved uh, into more kind of marketing role. And it was always a debate uh, where like if you're building a function of SDRs or BDRs, where they should sit, right? And, some, and people will be like fighting, like not, not literal, but you know, it will be like debates and debates, like uh, should they sit in, with marketing, should they sit with sales, and everyone will have like 10 different kind of bullet items of opinions. Uh, but then I actually read one really strong book on this, and there was a statement that I kind of wholeheartedly ag agree with. And that statement, was that it should sit with that part of organization that has a desire and passion to own it. And it's very, very similar to, uh, to what we've been discussing. So it doesn't matter. What matters is ownership, uh, inspiration. If, if, for example, if you have an IT organization that has that ownership and inspiration and business doesn't have it, then it might be an opportunity for them to kind of drive it, right? So that's why when we talk to our customers, we always ask them questions like, who would like by give, getting this opportunity, by getting this assignment, who would be the most excited? Who would drive that energy? And this energy really defines uh, a possible success. So that, that, would be that should definitely go on the Creatio TikTok. Like just yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. TikTok. Yeah. I, I I don't have an account, but my wife does. So. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Community. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So the question we have, we're the ones, we're in sales, and we are the ones that are really pushing for this. Now, our IT guy wasn't really in there for a good way. Um, but the question I have is, how much workflow do we, we know what we want? What's going to be placed on his plate that can make all this happen? So uh, that's a good question. Um, I think that it's important to understand the use case. And you know, uh, we, we've been presenting this application matrix with all sorts of different tiers. Uh, if this is a kind of sales out of the box processes, so the expectation is not much, right? So uh, majority of our customers fully empowered to use out of the box capabilities and IT does have certain responsibilities there, but mo most of those projects can be driven by a business organization. But in the meantime, when we say, say business organization, we're gonna talk about that this no-code development persona, like a person who accumulates a certain amount of skills, right? So you cannot give it to a random, say, salesperson who doesn't understand technology, doesn't understand structure, right? So you need to have someone, A, who will be, who will be able to own it, <clears throat> and secondly, who has an understanding of a workflow, who thinks with processes in mind, right? And if you find this person, then technology is secondary because we will provide needed capabilities and empower them to do whatever they want, but you need to have this process mindset uh, embedded into the, in, into the team to be successful as a business, and then have this alignment going with IT folks. We can discuss it like, in more details um, and um, dig, uh, dig deeper into your use case, but that will be like, very generic uh, and quick answer to your question. Okay. Yeah, the, the question really comes down to how much do they want to be involved? You know, uh, do they just want configuration? Do they just want final sign-off on you know, changes and so forth? But it's a great conversation to have. Okay. And it's also so probably how much uh, legacy data or legacy systems you want to connect as well. 
It's another part of it, because they may want to own those API connections. Uh, but if everything's happening within the Creative platform, well, then maybe even less. Yeah. OK. And actually, this brings us to the next logical, the next logical question. So imagine that we, yes, we have this buy-in to set up uh, a, center of, a center of excellence, right? So what kind of a structure do we need to have in place? Like, what types of skill sets and roles do we need to have, at least to start with? Arjun, I think you're the best one to kick it off. Yeah, so uh, in terms of the, the kind of role mix, um, typically Center of Excellence is going to have some practitioners, right? people who roll their sleeves up and are able to, to do the do. right? Uh, so they're capable with the low-code or no-code platform in this case. But then you're also going to have a layer of facilitators, so to speak. I mean, whatever they're called, architects, right? People who understand the, the lay of the land, who perhaps control a series or a portfolio of projects, who probably have one foot in the business, right? They understand use cases. And, you know, they probably have a, a connection with the heads of department or existing portfolio managers. So they're able to source that demand into these centers of excellence. And ultimately, I think uh, with a center of excellence, right, it's... Uh, it's not going to have all of the, uh, the capability internally, right? The idea is to have arms and legs out inside the business, right? So you are going to want to uh, dispel that kind of excellence, um, train up individuals within the business to actually uh, create themselves. But where support is needed, you can actually go in and, and, and tactically deliver that. I think at the top level as well, in a mature organization, a uh, center of excellence should have someone with a kind of strategic view because uh, quite often you're going to have roadblocks that can only be addressed at the strategic level, right? A classic example is uh, you don't hire a sales salesperson to go and build an app, right? You hire them to sell. Uh, yeah. So how do you encourage someone to go and refine the processes with which they play? I mean, you're operating them daily. You see the unoptimized inefficiencies. What gives you that, that, that kind of leeway to go and create it? Well, that has to be an HR policy that needs to be amended, and that has to be at the strategic level. Right, so I think in a mature COE, you're going to have three layers. It's a practitioner, a sort of an architect, uh, and a strategist. OK. You have, uh, I, yeah, I, see, I see that you really want to answer. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I totally agree. I'm just going to frame it in a slightly different way. So I think you've got the, the people that come up with the ideas on the front line, the, the opportunity right, the thing that you want to do. You need to have coaching, right? So the companies that I've seen that have really adopted this, and the way you really scale is you have to have a coaching culture whereby someone can have an opportunity, you know, a, a, an area where they want to build, and that's like, you know, your innovation stage, your ideation stage, mm -hmm. but actually turning that into something, right? You need to draw on experience. And, you know, I use examples where there's organizations who might have 5,000 citizen developers and they might have a 500-person coaching ecosystem mm -hmm. that's designed for that. So that really gives it that kind of momentum and based on experience driving that. The, the, the third persona is, I think, a combination of what Arjun's just said, which is the, the visionary behind the strategy, the operating model, the culture, and how that aligns with an organizational priority, right? And I, I think we all hear the term of science projects and you build an app and you try and it just, it just gets killed, right? Because you don't get the buy-in, you haven't got the project manager on it, you haven't got the buy-in the, from the business, you haven't got the money to do anything. So actually mitigating that early and having that sponsorship is really critical. Cool. Philip, do you have a different opinion about this? Yeah. I completely agree with that. And I think, yeah. um, I think one of the, just to dive in on one point that Sam said, one of the powers of no code is that when it comes to executive sponsorship, uh, instead of just explaining in a one pager to an executive, hey, uh, this is why we want to do this, and like this is what it would solve for us, you can say, hey, can you just open up your phone really quick? I built the app already. Um, that power is so like if you get a free trial and like just just do it, right? Use dummy data and just do it. I'll still never forget the day I was at, so I used to, first start my own company, I worked at Compass, the real estate technology company, and we used a no-code platform for onboarding our real estate agents called Enboarder. And I'll still never forget the day I got the green light from a VP was literally just because I said, uh, what's your phone number? And he gave it to me, and it sent him a text message with the full workflow, and he goes, cool, here's $250,000 to do it. 
It was, it was, it was no one pager. It was, no, you know, it was, no, it was just like he got to see the actual workflow and how beautifully mobile he optimized it was. So get it in play and then show the work to the, you know, folks as opposed to just describing it. Yeah, you know, I also have like a funny um, anecdote or a funny story to share with you. Like we, we were having a meeting with our customer and they didn't have by that time a center for excellence for NOCO, but they really wanted to set it up and they were asking questions and we were discussing the structures, the roles, and then they have a VP who kind of oversees this uh, kind of business slash technology group that helps with all the deployment. And he like came up with an idea, and uh, like it was half truth and like half like his real opinion, half a joke. But um, I really, really enjoyed it. He said, "Like, look, we know we, we need to uh, stop at where we have an entrance at uh, 4 p.m. on Friday, and everyone that is kind of uh, getting out at 4 p.m. on Friday, this means they doesn't have any work, and they should be a no-code developer. We can make them busier <laughs> with no-code development because they certainly have time to uh, to configure system." So, uh, but then, of course, he, uh, he laughed at that. But, uh, of course, this structure uh, is super important. The structure of, like, who, how, how do you engage and whom do you engage is super important. And I guess to develop this um, discussion, like, based on your experience, guys, uh, would you expect uh, Center of Excellence be a full-time function when you have, like, people with job spec, no code developer? Or, you, or your expectation would be that they, those will be kind of part-time engagements depending on the skill set? So probably, Phil, why, why, Philip, why, do, why don't we proceed with you? Yeah, I think it starts as a, as a part-time role, okay. um, typically, uh, because for the organization to want to invest more, they have to see, okay, well, do we want to expand the usage of no-code and low-code within our organization, uh, that more people are doing it, that we want to fund this more? And if you do, the more you scale it, the more you need things like a center of excellence. And it should probably have somebody full-time over it if it's, you know, if you have a thousand no-code developers, uh, making it three par people's part-time job that makes less sense than just having one person overseeing the structure and empowerment of it. Um, so I'm a big fan of, mm -hmm. of hiring somebody eventually into it. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, like the other, <laughs> the other reason I would avoid hiring someone too fast is mm -hmm. because let's say you hire somebody, it doesn't get adoption, and then all of a sudden, like mm -hmm. it, it, if you do it too prematurely, it can almost like look like that person's fault or wow. like the role is no longer needed, you know. And so I always think, you know, crawl, walk, run. Uh, yeah. Build a need for it and then hire into it. I would agree. I would agree. Eric, would you have a different experience? Uh, so the way I look at it, obviously, company size has a lot to do with it, right? So mid-size organization, you might not have, you know, full-time dedicated staff. I view it more almost like you'd have a project team on standby, right? Anytime something comes up, you know, these are your experts. I think one of the real benefits people don't think of when we talk about this is consolidating your platform, making sure there's not a bunch more solutions that are purchased in place, right? Because when a new challenge arises, the business brings you something when you have that group of experts internally who can look at the tools you have and you know be familiar with no code. Say, hey, can Creatio do this? Let's take a look at that. Where without it, you might just have another you know system uh, in the uh, in the ecosystem somebody went out and bought because you, you don't have those in-house experts who could look for their own solutions. Actually, so. I actually have a question for all of you on that front. Is that uh -huh. okay? Because <laughs> I want to learn. Uh, so. How do you solve for the problem of people on the ground, like let's say there's a center of excellence or not, or it's just in its infancy stages. How do you solve for the problem that um, folks don't even know what's capable on the ground and the tools that are even available to them to solve those challenges? Like they don't even know. How do you solve for that internally? Um, yeah. You mean within the customer base? Yeah, yeah. So like, you know, yeah, you're, you're in your company and you have Creative or you have, you know, no code tool. Mm -hmm. But the, the people in the call center, they don't even know that's like an option or a thing. And even if they did, they don't know uh, what they could even do or capabilities that they could solve within. Like, how do you solve for that discoverability problem? Yeah, that's why we have account managers who are amazing at what they do and make sure, <laughs> make, make sure we have champions all through the organization that, uh, uh, you know, they're familiar with the capabilities. And like you had mentioned, you know, you can build an app overnight in some cases. And there's nothing more powerful than somebody mentions a business challenge hey, I built this thing over the weekend, check it out. And you want to have those champions in-house that you know, can sell that value mm -hmm. for you and help grow the organization. Yeah, so that's, that's how we do it. Good, good account management. <laughs> <laughs> I will add a small bit, and then I know Sam wants to, uh, to add a little bit more. Um, look, uh, it's, it's fair to say that sometimes capability is going ahead 
like uh, technological capability has gone ahead of organizational capability. People have all those features and functions, but they're not mature enough to take those features and functions and make them part of a process. And um, that's the reason why we have partners. That's the reason why we actually uh, work with guys like PMI and um, uh, FTI. That's the reason why we developed our no-code playbook. It's because we want to make sure that this alignment between having a capability and then being able to utilize that and convert it into organizational capability is in place. Because otherwise you will have all those features, but there is not much use of that because you're not, you're not getting the most out of it. But I know Sam has an opinion just, here. Yeah, just two points. So I think sometimes the concept of a COE is the outcome of an organization having an impact around this, right? So you don't start with a COE. You've got to start by delivering some value, right? The nature of a COE, if you think about it, a COE, we're talking about centralizing something. We're talking about centralizing governance. Central. The concept of no code is, and, and this movement is around decentralization, right? So it's like you don't, it's important to look at the operating model, the process. A COE doesn't mean you have to have so much control that you stifle any innovation from happening, right? And the companies that I see, if they were to start with mobilizing a COE, they'd be dead. They wouldn't, they wouldn't do anything because there'd be too many barriers to start and the value wouldn't be there and they wouldn't get any buy-in. Mm -hmm. and, and often a COE is once you've reached a certain level of maturity where you want to put that structure in place because you're past that early discovery and experimentation phase, you're at the kind of scale, adopt phase. You need to have that, that structure. I think it comes down to structure, right? especially with the bigger organizations. Yeah, absolutely. I think the structure is defining and also it's important to give it uh, a little bit of freedom, not a little bit, like enough freedom. Um, and the reason being is that you don't want to replicate another non-IT, but IT organization, right? So the only reason why you're doing that is by allowing this democracy, allowing this democratization to flow through your organization. But uh, and is w w with all democracies, you need to construct a model where the freedom exists and when they can experiment and then they have enough of space to do that. But in the meantime, not to turn that into an anarchy, you have to have needed guardrails, you have to have governance checks and all the needed balances. Just to add, right? So agree with everything you guys say. It's, it's very much about maturity of the organization and the scale of the intent. But one thing we're, we're actually seeing is some of them want to jump all of that, and it, particularly in regulated industries like financial services. Mm -hmm. They want to have that blueprint, that ready-made blueprint straight up, and they want to have hundreds of people straight off the bat, right? So they're looking at setting up a hub right off the bat, right? Setting up spokes across the different parts of the business, all of the tools, all of the training, all of the guidance already pre-baked. So they're, they're actually skipping that maturity loop. So, yeah, so in order to make, so the investment required for a COE is money. How do you get access to money? I guess the, you, that works if you've got, so in your instance, for example, with FS, if you've got the sponsorship down from the person that's got the money, that becomes a reality. You can do it. You, I guess you, you build you, a thing that works. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> and but, then you get money. But if you, if, you don't have the, if you don't have the money, you don't have the buy-in to go and say, you know, if I go to the CEO of PMI and say, I want to go and mobilize a COE, and by the way, I need five million quid, and they're going to go, well, what? Why? And they're going to drill down and ask me why three times, and I'm not going to have an answer, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if I've got his buy-in and he sees the value, then it's a different conversation. And I think in FS, what you're talking about, I think it's the agenda and the compelling event that's driving that to happen because the regulation is a really strong business case. Mm -hmm. right? it, is. it is. It is. Cool stuff. So we, uh, I, I suggest we give a round of applause to this absolute incredible panel. <laughs> Eric, make make sure. Each of them receive five stickers. Five stickers. Yeah. Five Where's stickers. Paulina? Right. And all the questions that we received also, let's make sure that we award uh, our audience with stickers. So thank you so much, guys. We will proceed. The next part will be the design phase that we'll go into the details. But we'll bring uh, Sam and PMI team back on the citizen development discussion. So thank you so much.